today. Unfortunately, it was working until the CB put his hand on it and somehow I killed it. So you're going to have to listen closely and we'll just have to enunciate to the back of the room. My name is Kevin Cook. I'm director of veteran services here at Milton. And I just want to say here in this sacred ground, thank you, God. Thank you for this beautiful day. If I had to list the weather I want for Memorial Day, check, check, check. This is it. This is the most perfect weather we've had this stretch and I am truly thankful for it. We're going to start off by having the uh, Milton High Chorus with List Every Voice and then followed by the National Anthem. If you are able to stand, please stand and remove your cover. All members of the military, former veterans are allowed to salute and I highly, highly encourage you to stand and salute. As a veteran, you earned that right. Yeah. <laughs> 
every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing. Faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Can the commanders bring your men to attention? Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red breath of arms bursting Well, now I have an invocation by Reverend Kirkham Hall, St. Michael's Episcopal Church, Milton, Massachusetts. O oh, Holy One, in the silent stirring of our hearts on this day, we hold before you the memories of those who with compassion for suffering and conviction of purpose, ventured their lives and gave them over to serve your call of liberty for the captives, security for the weak, the lifting of the bar from the oppressed, and the care and nurture for the wounded and dying on fields of battle and of chaos. Sanctify in their deaths, their yearning for peace, for liberty, and for an end to suffering, and make their memories hymns of gratitude, benediction, and counsel that sustain each of us in the steps that we take today and going forward. Amen. We'll now have welcoming remarks by Chairman James Coyne, Milton Cemetery Trustees. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you and good morning. My wife said I always have an Irish whisper, so I don't think I'll need a microphone. My name is James Coyne, and on behalf of the fellow cemetery trustees, Stephen Pender, Joseph Ridden, Jed Dolan, and Terrence Driscoll, I welcome you to the 2023 Memorial Day service here in the veterans section of the Milton Cemetery on this beautiful morning. Behind me is the final resting place of all those that gave their lives for the protection of this great country and all its freedoms. This is a somber day of reflection, a time to remember those men and women who have helped deliver us our freedoms, but who never got the chance to step off the battlefield. The grounds of Milton Cemetery are a unique place. While it is part of the everyday scene, it is not part of the everyday life. That is to say, it is a place where tranquility and quiet are the desired norm and should be treated with dignity and respect at all times when visiting. Our superintendent, Lisa Ahern, along with her incredible staff, they include Meg Toyas, Mark Chapman, Matthew Belafato, Joe Baxter, Joshua Savory, Dave Kuna, 
Solomon Rodriguez, Wanda Pacasandre, and Jack Ryder are the reasons for this in what we like to describe as the most beautiful municipal cemetery in Massachusetts. It is also important to recognize the countless volunteers led by Veterans Agent Kevin Cook that took it upon themselves a few weeks back to make sure that each and every veteran's grave and residence at the Milton Cemetery was visited and adorned with a brand new American flag to honor their service to this great country. They are not forgotten and never will be. In total, more than 1,700 flags were placed. As a nation, we made a promise, a promise that must be kept. On behalf of the fellow trustees and our staff, thank you for being in attendance today as we honor those who have made the supreme sacrifice for our freedom. Thank you. I'm going to have the Pledge of Allegiance led by the Girl Scouts, and we have a different troop this year who stepped in, Troop 70724 from Milton. Girls, are you ready? All right, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Hand over heart. Go ahead. You, you, you lead us. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Someday, each of us will not be here. This is the future generation of Milton, and we will always include them in our ceremonies because we want them to be the ones doing this when we aren't here to do it for us. Thank you, girls. You have my thanks and my admiration. And I'm sure it'd be easier for you to go sit in the shade now that you're going to listen to a bunch of people like me do this for about a half an hour. So please, you may go off to your parents. I stood in formation at so many ceremonies for like forever. And I know what that feels like. And I have admiration for my police and fire and scouts because I know what that feels like. But the Girl Scouts, I think I'm gonna give them an excuse today and let them stand off. Um, Frank Stout called me yesterday and unfortunately he's been called away due to a, a family situation. So he could not be here to represent the Legion but I will stand in his place and represent the members of the Legion 114 post with today's dignitary recognition. 2023 Memorial Day dignitaries, first and foremost, we recognize the residents of the town of Milton who make this possible. You are our most highest dignitary. There can be no greater honor than what you do for our veterans and our fallen here at Milton Cemetery. So you are our most important person. Thank you. U.S. Representative Stephen Lynch, Senator Walter Timothy, who will be here with us later. I saw him in Randolph this morning at about 9 o'clock, and he was on the run. So he'll be coming in probably at the tail end of our ceremony. Representative William Driscoll, Representative Fluker Oakley, Michael F. Zulis, Chairman of the Milton Select Board, Aaron G. Bradley, Vice Chair, Select Board, Benjamin Zoll, Select Board Member, Roxanne Musto, RN, Select Board Member. Richard Wells, Select Board Member. Nicholas Milano, Town Administrator. Milton Cemetery Trustee Jim Coyne and his board. Lisa Ahern and her uh, military superintendent and her staff who made this place look like the beautiful place that it is every year. And thank you, Lisa, for all your support with our Flags in, which is one of the most well-attended veterans events every year and I thank you for that. Our keynote speaker, Senior Chief Construction Member Dan Yasserino, U.S. Navy, and uh, I take responsibility on the back of a program, if you have one in your hand, I managed to muck up his rate with my uh, king. I put him in as a yeoman senior chief instead of construction senior chief. So I took ownership of that with the senior chief because uh, I shouldn't have made that keying error, but I did, so I own my own mistakes. Uh, town meeting moderator Robert Hiss, Reverend Kirkham Hall, Rector St. Michael's Church, American Legion Post Number 114 Commander Paul McDonald, Milton's Gold Star families, 
who we are. It, all, for all you've done, and all you endured in our name. And of course, Milton veterans and their families. I'll now bring up Milton Middle School student Piper Bergen, Project 351 Ambassador, who will read the Project 351 proclamation from the government. challenge coin. It was established when I came on board seven years ago, at that time ago, and it is a, a long-serving tradition of a military member superior to a junior member in recognition of the job well done. Thank you. We will now have remarks by the chair of our select board. Michael F. Zulis. Veterans and first responders, elected officials, Reverend Clergy, Senior Chief Petty Officer Gasserino, and other distinguished guests, and my fellow celebrants. A few weeks ago, during the flags in ceremony that Mr. Cook mentioned, my daughters and I read some of the headstones in the older section of the cemetery. And when you look at some of the headstones that are 100 years old, or 200 years old, or even, even older, they often contain brief stories of the lives of the departed. And sometimes, sometimes you can discern some of the values that they lived. On one of them in the old section of the cemetery, you can read about Captain Louis Bowes, a soldier of the War of the Revolution, who died on January 9, 1835, at age 74. When we read the stories on those headstones and we think about their values, then those who went before us live on. And that is what today is about, keeping alive the memory service members who passed on and the values for which they served and fought and died. Now, many of us have stories, stories about service members who passed on and many of us are inspired by the lives and their values. Here are just a few from our select board members. 
During World War II, Vincent Murphy served in the Army's Cavalry Division. He was deployed to Normandy three days after the beaches were stormed on D-Day, and there he served during the most challenging of circumstances. Also during World War II, Joseph Bradley Jr. served as a tech sergeant in the Army's Air Corps Division. He was based in Wickham, England during World War II. Mr. Murphy and Tech Sergeant Bradley were the grandfathers of Select Board member Aaron Bradley and the grandfather and the great-grandfather of Carolyn Bradley, who's here today. The Musto family, who serve and volunteer in our town in so many ways, including by the work of Select Board member Roxanne Musto, are inspired by the commitment to liberty and freedom of expression shown by current veterans and those who've gone before. And by their service to our town, Roxanne Musto and her family show their gratitude for our veterans. When World War II <coughs> broke out, Richard Wells Sr. was in Dorchester High School. Dorchester High School. Two of his older brothers, Harold and Robert, joined the Army and were deployed to France and later to Germany. Mr. Wells Sr. from Dorchester High School and his brother Jack followed him. They joined the Navy and were deployed to the Pacific Theater. The Wells family was one of just two families in Dorchester that had four stars, four serving in the war. The other was the family of Milton Town Meeting member and MATV host Brian Kelly. But back to Mr. Wells Sr. He returned home from the war, joined the Milton Police Department and served in 1950 and served for 44 years. He was especially proud of being a veteran and later in life, he chose a grave in this cemetery, right over there, right at the corner. And he apparently joked that he would, he would at least get visitors on Memorial Day. And that one or two might need to sit and rest on his gravestone. So if you have a moment today, give Mr. Wells a visit, that grave right over there. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind if he needed to take a rest for a moment against his, re his gravestone. Of course, Mr. Wells Sr.'s son is our select board mem member, Richard Wells Jr. Just like Mr. Wells during World War II, David Joy Zoll Jr. enlisted in the U U.S. Army upon graduating from high school. Tech Sergeant Zoll later served in the Army Air Corps Band. When he returned to civilian life, Tech Sergeant Zoll became a music teacher. And for the rest of his life, he volunteered to play taps at the funerals of veterans. He earned an Honor Guard Award for his lifetime of playing taps for veterans. But last year, taps were played for Tech Sergeant Zoll, when he was laid to rest at age 94. Tech Sergeant Zoll's grandson, select board member Ben Zoll, was little today. And finally, on July 16, 1914, Michael Petros Zulus arrived at the port of New York on a ship called the Patras after a long trip from his hometown in Parga, Greece. He was later employed as a cook at Phillips Academy in Andover when he enlisted in the U.S. Army on September 21, 1917. After Congress enacted the Alien Naturalization Act on May 9, 1918 to make it easier for those serving in World War I to become citizens, citizens. My grandfather, while he was still in the Army, petitioned for and received his U.S. citizenship. He was one of 192,000 immigrants who became citizens as a result of their World War I service. To borrow a line from the Broadway musical Hamilton, during World War I, immigrants, they got the job done. My grandfather later found his way to Dorchester. Everything always seems to lead to Dorchester. And there, there he married Mabel Catherine Zulus, uh, Mabel Catherine Malone from Boston, but that's, that's a story for another day. Um, on all days, but particularly on this day, we should talk about the stories and the memories of our departed service members, and we should appreciate the values for which they served, and they fought, and they died. When we do that, then those that serve live on through their stories, and the values for which they serve live on through us. Thank you.
will now have the Milton High Chorus, the marching band with the Armed Forces Salute. As your service is called, if you are a member of the military, you may stand and salute in recognition of your service anthem.
Memorial Day order, Headquarters Grand Army of the Republic, Washington, D.C., May 5th, 1868. General Orders, number 11. The 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet and churchyard in the land we call America. In this observance, no form or ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect to circumstances made permanent. We are organized, comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and marines who united to suppress the late rebellion. What can aid more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead? who made their breasts a barricade between our country and its foes. Their soldier lives with the revelry of freedom to erase and change in their deaths the tattoo of rebellious tyranny in ours. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance, all that the consecrated wealth and taste of the nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to their memory of her slain defense. Let no want for tread rudely on such hollow grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverend visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull, and other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remains inside of us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and gown the passionless mounds above them the choicest flowers of spring. Let us raise above them the dear old glory and save them from this home. Let us, in this solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those who have left among us the sacred charge upon the nation's gratitude, soldiers and sailors, widows and orphans. It is the purpose of the commander in chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope that it will be kept from year to year, while a survivor of war remains to all the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to call attention to this work and let it friendly, let its friendly aid and bring it to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance with their end. Department commanders will use every effort to make this order effective. By command of John A. Logan, Commander in Chief, National Thank you, Richard. General Logan's order is what codified what we do here on Memorial Day, and I would hope that he would know in heaven that it's still being carried out to this day across our nation and is one of the most poignant and important orders that we've ever received in our armed forces. We're going to have a placement of the wreaths. We have two Legion members, Austin McGurk and Jim Canale, who will come and just place the wreath for us at the memorial and render a hand salute. Gentlemen, please come forward. Come on. You can just pick up the roof. Just step back and then place it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead.
again, you have my thanks for everything today, all of who contributed to today's celebrations and our ceremonies. I'm only one person. There's no way I could do this all by myself. It takes many, many hands, and I really deeply appreciate everything that's done to make this possible, except for the planes. <laughs> I'm a big student of history, as you may know, and when I bring history forward, it's in remembrance to make sure that those we talk about here are not forgotten, and that maybe you'll share the story to someone else, and in turn, that story spreads out. I'm going to feature a little information about a unit I discovered, and then the news story that brought this to my attention, and I will read that story to you from Arlington National Cemetery our most sacred ground. The United States Colored Troops, USCT, were Union Army regiments during the American Civil War that primarily comprised African Americans with soldiers from other ethnic groups that also served in USCT units. Established in response to a demand for more units from the Union Army commanders, by the end of the war in 1865, USCT regiments, which numbered 175 in total, constituted one-tenth of the manpower of the Army. Approximately 20% of USCT soldiers were killed in action or died of disease or other causes, a rate 35% higher than white Union troops. Numerous UCT soldiers fought with distinction including 16 who received the Medal of Honor. The USCT regiments were precursors to the Buffalo Soldier Units that fought in the American Indian War. We remember these brave men today for their sacrifice, who stood out of slavery and took up arms to defend our nation, a nation which had enslaved them, but were dedicated to the principles of freedom and courage and honor and dedication. The news story that's the follow-up to this, which brought it to my attention. This is recent, this is 2023, just about three, four weeks ago from Arlington National Cemetery. U.S. Union Captain Isaac Hart probably never imagined that while leading his company of black cavalry men, during the American Civil War, his remains would be laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery in 2023. But that's exactly what happened recently in Section 76. Hart, a white man from New Bedford, Massachusetts, joined the U.S. Army on April 16, 1861, 11 days after Confederates had fired on Fort Sumter, igniting the war. He served in two different Massachusetts regiments before joining the U.S. Colored Troops USCT 2nd Cavalry Regiment for the war's last year and a half. With that regiment, he helped capture Bermuda 100, a strategic location in Virginia, and laid siege to Petersburg and Richmond. Leading a black unit in the war took extreme courage. The Confederate Congress threatened to severely punish or execute officers found leading black troops. After the war, Hart remained in the Army for more than a year and rose to the rank of Brevet Major. Meanwhile, he was a husband and father of two, and his first wife Clementine passed away and married his second wife Anna, and their marriage lasted until 1913 when he died of unknown causes. Yet Hart was never buried. His remains were placed in an urn on a shelf in unclaimed remains in Cincinnati, Ohio Cemetery. They were recently rediscovered there by a man preparing to bury a family member. He researched Major Hart and found one of his descendants living in Albion, Indiana. Hart's great-great-niece, Rachel Bender, who traveled with her husband to the cemetery to claim her ancestors' remains and then contacted Arlington National Cemetery for a proper burial. On a sunny day, recently, a small crowd of about 17 people, including four Union Army reenactors and two National Park Service Rangers gathered to pay their final respects as a horse-drawn caisson delivered Hart to his final burial location. I know that Isaac was loved and that he will forever be missed 
Army Chaplain Captain John Ulrich told the gathering, but I also know that he will never be forgotten. I salute Major Hart of New Bedford, Massachusetts and all his troops, including those who never returned. They have my thanks and my grateful heart that they did what they did to help our nation. Thank you. Our featured speaker today is U.S. Navy Senior Chief Constructionman Danny Yasserino, and I have a little information on him. It's not often I can share the dais with a CV, which is a great thing. Maybe it was the two CVs together that made the sound system die, I don't know. But he also served in a unit that I've served in, which is the 7th Naval Construction Regiment, and that was the unit I deployed to Iraq with. So it's another bond that we share, even though I'm a little longer in the tooth than I think the senior chief may be. Senior Chief Petty Officer Danny Asserino is a native of Connecticut, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Management at Winnipeg, Winnipeg University. In 2004, relocated to Massachusetts, beginning his career in commercial construction in the Boston area. I've been, been a Milton resident since 2015. On July 30th, 2004, Senior Chief enlisted in the United States Navy Reserve as a construction man through Naval Reserve Ascension Course. And upon, upon completing basic training at Recruit Training Command, he was assigned to Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 27. During his tour at NMVC 27, held various positions in a local detachment out of Quincy, Charlie Company, and battalion operations. In 2008, second class petty officer, he was mobilized Operation Iraqi Freedom. And during his deployment to Iraq, he was a crew leader on various construction projects in both Al-Assad and Balad air bases. In 2012, he deployed as part of the Air Detachment, NMCB-27, supporting U.S. Southern Command Operation New Dawn. And while he was with the detachment of CBs in El Salvador, he was QAQC and safety leading petty officer on a rappel tower improvement project. His next duty station was the 7th Naval Construction Regiment where his training department leading petty officer was important for increasing readiness of the regiment and two construction battalions. During this time, he was involved in planning and execution of two post -ex exercises and part of a regiment relocation from Newport, Rhode Island to Gulfport, Mississippi. <laughs> in 2020, Senior Chief was assigned to Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 14 based in Gulfport, holding various leadership positions. He's currently the Battalion Operations Department leading Chief Petty Officer. He resides here in Milton. His wife Ashley and his daughters Olivia and Violet were both students at Cunningham Elementary School. He's employed by Lincoln Property Company as a commercial construction project manager in Boston. And his personal awards include three Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medals, one Army Achievement Medal, and various unit campaign awards. I give you our featured speaker, Senior Chief Construction Member, U.S. Navy Dan Yasharino. I'm, I'm a little hard of hearing, so if you guys can't hear, feel free, don't be shy, come closer, please. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction and for the invitation to these hallowed halls hallowed grounds on such a beautiful spring day. I am humbled and grateful for this opportunity to speak here. Good morning to all of our distinguished guests, our elected officials, Milton Board of Selectmen, town administrators, and clergy. Thank you to all of my Milton neighbors, friends, family, and fellow veterans for being here today. I'd also like to acknowledge my beautiful wife, Ashley, and our daughters, Olivia. I would not be able to do what I do if it wasn't for their patience and support. If there are any Gold Star families in attendance today, I think I speak for everyone here in saying that our nation is truly grateful for your family sacrifice. Similar to many public buildings in any town or city or the buildings on the college campus, most of the roads and buildings on a military installation and the ships in the U.S. Navy are named. Ships are categorized into classes and each ship has a theme. New aircraft carriers, 
are named for U.S. presidents, while well, one class of submarines is named after states of the Union. Guided missile cruisers are named after historic battles. Many ships, streets, and buildings are aptly named for people who played a significant role in history, are war heroes or leaders, or were killed in combat. Many of us know little about these people whose names are displayed so prominently all around us. As was mentioned in my biography, I'm a Navy CB. The CB nickname is a heterograph of the initial letters C and B from the words Construction Battalion. After the attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan in 1941, the United States had about 70,000 men working on construction contracts overseas. International law made it illegal for civilian workers to resist an enemy attack, so the Navy conceived conceived the idea of Seabees to replace these civilian construction companies in combat zones. The Seabees have played a significant role in the Navy's history, participating in every major conflict since their birthday on March 5, 1942. Although the mission of the Seabees is to build, we're also trained to fight. On many occasions, Seabees have found ourselves under fire with the Marine Corps. Since World War II, 22 Civil Engineer Corps officers and 353 Seabees have been killed in action and over 500 have died on job sites. Now I'd like to tie these two topics together by telling several stories of Seabees who have been killed in action. I'll start this journey by taking you on a short tour of the Naval Construction Battalion Center in Gulfport, Mississippi, which is home to the Atlantic Fleet Seabees. The headquarters building of NCBC Gulfport is located at 4902 Marvin Shields Boulevard. Construction mechanic third class Marvin Shields is the first and only CB to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. While CB Team 1104 was deployed to Vietnam, the Battle of Dong Zai took place from June 9th to 13th, 1965. An Army Special Forces camp that was under construction by the CBs was mortared by a Viet Cong regiment. After being wounded by, by the mortar fire, Shields fought with Special Forces soldier, soldiers against the enemy, carrying up needed ammunition to the firing line positions. Although wounded again by shrapnel and shot in the jaw, he helped the soldier and CB carry the badly wounded Special Forces captain in charge of the camp to a safer position on the compound. After four more hours of fighting, and greatly weakened, Shields volunteered to help a Special Forces second lieutenant destroy a Viet Cong machine gun outside the perimeter, which was threatening to kill everyone. The lieutenant, armed with a rocket launcher, which was loaded by Shields, destroyed the machine gun. And on the way back to the building, the lieutenant was wounded for the fourth time, and Shields for the third time, shot both legs. Shields was air evacuated to Saigon with five other Seabees, but died during the evacuation, just 25 years old. In addition to the street in Gulfport from 1969 until 1992, there was also a Navy frigate named in honor of Marvin Shields. And today, there's a barracks at the Little Creek Naval Amphibious Base that bears his name. If you're going to spend a night on base in Gulfport, you might stay at the Stetham Memorial Navy Lodge. Steelworker second class Robert Stetham, who was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, was killed during the hijacking of TWA Flight 847 in 1985 at the age of 23. While on his way back from the United States to the United States from an assignment in Greece, he was held for 17 days with 38 other hostages. When the terrorist demands were not met, SW2, SW2 Stepham was targeted because he was a member of the U.S. military. He was beaten, tortured, and finally the terrorists shot him in the temple and dumped his body onto the tarmac at the Beirut airport. Several builds and, ro and roads at various military installations bear the Stepham name, as well as the destroyer, the USS Stepham. If you're looking to hit the gym on base in Gulfport, you'll go to the Raymond J. Border Fitness Center. Builder Chief Petty Officer Raymond Border was killed at 31 years old 
by an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan on October 19, 2011. His friends have told me that he was a larger-than-life man with a huge smile. He loved his family, the Navy, and his sailors. In 2008, I had the good fortune to spend two weeks in, class, in a class he instructed and can attest to these qualities. Fitness was a way of life for Chief Porter, so it was appropriate, an appropriate tribute that the new gym on base was named in his honor just two years ago. In 1943, the Navy took possession of Quaddy Village in Eastport, Maine to use as a CB training center. In 1944, the camp was named for the first civil engineer corps officers killed in action. Lieutenant Irwin Lee and Lieutenant J.G. George Stevenson of the 24th Naval Construction Battalion. While leading their troops in combat against the Japanese, Lee and Stevenson were killed in a Japanese air raid on Rendova, a Solomon Island, along with 23 enlisted men. Not only was the CB Training Center named Camp Lee Stevenson, but most of the 30 streets on the camp were named for the enlisted CBs that died with Lee and Stevenson on Rendova. Other, the other streets were named for CBs killed elsewhere in the war. Although the area is no longer used by the Navy, a monument stands in the former training center's location, and all of the public streets in the area still bear the names of these CBs. Eleven years ago, on the Little Creek Naval Amphibious Base in Virginia, a new building was dedicated to Lieutenant Carl Milford Olson. He was the first American officer killed during a land invasion in Europe during World War II. During World War I, Carl Olson was an enlisted radioman in the Navy. After the war, he attended University of Minnesota, graduating with a degree in civil engineering. For the next 18 years, he worked in the civilian sector including during the start of World War II, where he was writing specifications and contracts for ordnance plans. But it was his strict devotion and patriotism to his country that propelled him to leave his civilian job, wife, and kids to, to rejoin the Navy at the age of 42 as a Civil Engineer Corps officer. During the war, he helped develop and build many of the fittings and attachments which made the CB pontoon causeways and rhino ferries successful in landing operations. The ramp used for unloading cargo at the front of each of these huge barges was also known as the Olsen ramp. It was while he was on one of these pontoons that an enemy bomb hit, causing his death while liberating the port of Naples, Italy. Lieutenant Olsen died in action at the head of his men as an outstanding example of an engineer an officer. The last seven names I'm going to share do not have their names on a ship or building. They are, however, etched on a monument in a park on Naval Air Station, Jacksonville, Florida. On April 30th, 2004, a tactical movement team from Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 14 was providing convoy security from Huseiba to Ramadi, Iraq came under insurgent attack. Equipment operator third class, Christopher Dickerson, and all hull maintenance technician, second class, Jason Dwelly, were killed in action that day. Five more were wounded. They had been in Iraq for less than two weeks. On May 2nd, 2004, just two days later, five CVs, also from NMCV-14, perished. 31 were wounded in a rocket attack at Forward Operating Base Junction City, Ramadi. The CBs that lost their lives were Builder Second Class, Michael Anderson, Equipment Operator Second Class, Trace Dossett, Construction Mechanic Second Class, Scott McHugh, Builder Second Class, Robert Jenkins, Steelworker Third Class, Ronald Ginther. This was the deadliest day for the CBs since the Vietnam War. All of these reserve CVs were from Florida and Georgia and ranged in age from 31 to 37 years old. I've told these stories today in order, to, in order to paint a picture which demonstrates that the names of heroes are all around us. Their names may not be on a ship 
building or street sign, but that doesn't make them any less important. Massachusetts alone has seen over 37,000 military deaths from the Revolutionary War until today. This number includes 80 Milton residents killed during World War II, one Milton resident during the war in Korea, and five of our neighbors killed in Vietnam. Each of these warriors who died for our nation and our way of life was a son or daughter. Many were husbands or wives, fathers or mothers. Some were doctors, mechanics, students, teachers, carpenters, or farmers. All were unique individuals tied together by a sense of purpose, a purpose greater than oneself that included a desire to fight against tyranny, oppression, or terrorism. John F. Kennedy remarked, a man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. This I American idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness does live on in our young nation, thanks to those who have willingly sacrificed their own lives. These patriots never got to live the life they dreamed of. President Reagan eloquently said, they gave up two lives the one they were living, and the one they would have lived. He also said, what they gave us is beyond our powers to repay. However, it is now our responsibility to carry on their unfinished work, to not only honor their memory, but to ensure peace and freedom lives on for our future generations. We must put aside our differences, find goodness in our fellow Americans, and come together as neighbors to advance the cause of liberty. So, my challenge to all of you is to ask yourself these questions. What am I doing to serve my community? And what will I do for freedom today? I'm proud to wear these anchors in service to my country. I'm honored to be here with all of you today, and I'm especially grateful for the love and support of my family. Thank you to the entire Milton community for your continued support of our first responders, veterans, and military personnel. Finally, let us remember and celebrate all those who willingly gave their lives for us by living the best life you can, not only in words, but in action. God bless all of you, and may God continue to bless America. I share Senior Chief's sentiments and his emotion. It's tough getting up here and talking about these things because they mean a lot. You may have noticed inside the program, if you received one today, an insert on Elliot Gruner. Janet Hazard, who gave this to me. Janet, are you here? There we go, okay. Janet Hassan brought this to my attention and her husband, as a member of her family, Elliot Gruner, who died in action in Milton, and asked me if I would share his story. And I was honored to. His story touched me. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for bringing this to our ceremony. I could not have done a better job selecting a more splendid person to honor than your uncle. And please remember him. He served and gave his life for all of us. Uniquely. Hang on a second. We've got to find a list among all the papers. We're going to read a list of all the veterans who were not here today. Didn't want it to fly away. And Senior Chief, you'll stand over here, please. And he will salute as we read each name to account for each member of our Milton veteran community who is no longer here. Robert G. Carmel, Korea. Oh yeah, you need, please bring your men to attention, I'm sorry. Robert G. Carmel, Korea, Marine Corps. You say absent. Absent. 
John D. Colfor, Korea, Marine Corps. Absent. John F. Kearns, Korea, Army. Absent. William Herbert Sebring, Vietnam, Army. Absent. Thomas J. Richardson, Vietnam, Coast Guard. Absent. Michael C. Walsh, Korea, Army. Absent. Paul T. McCarthy, Korea, Marine Corps. Absent. Andrew J. Sheehan, Korea, Army. Absent. James T. Gillis, Korea, Air Force. Absent. Maurice F. Russia, Vietnam, Army. Absent. Robert H. Begging, Korea, Army. Absent. William T. McGinnis, Vietnam, Navy. Absent. Thomas Masterson, Jr., Unknown Service, Army. Absent. Susan Mary Grimm, OIF, Iraq Air Force. Absent. Janie Henry William, Vietnam Army. Absent. Jose Antonio Vargas, Vietnam Navy. Absent. Theodore F. Coleman, Vietnam Army. Absent. John Tide, Vietnam Army. Absent. Luis Boris, Vietnam Army. Absent. Excuse me. John Tide was Navy. I got out of place there. Excuse me. John Tyne, Vietnam Navy, we've already slid there. George J. Leary, Jr., Korea Army. Absent. Joseph F. Lynch, World War II, Navy. Absent. Paul M. Lane, Korea Army. Absent. Robert A. Summerfield, World War II, Navy. Absent. Patrick J. McCloskey, Jr., Korea Air Force. Absent. Edmund B. E. Byer, Vietnam Army. Absent. Paul L. McDonough, Peacetime Army. Absent. Joseph E. Horan, World War II, Navy. Absent. Gerald R. Curtis, Korea Air Force. Absent. Gerald Toomey, Vietnam Army. Absent. Norman Barcelou, Korea. Absent. Arnold Kamale, Korea Navy. Absent. John Noel Chandler, Korea Air Force. Absent. Melvin Gondelman, Korea Army. Absent. Last name for taps and preparation, and please salute if you are capable. Paul H. Dobson, Vietnam Army. Absent. Senator Timothy was about an hour and a half ago, and he was in a full sprint. He is still, and without doubt, our greatest help for all the veterans in Milton, and I do owe him a large favor for including me in his transportation. Always an open air, always available. If I need something and I really I'm in trouble, I've got a constituent who's calling me a veteran says I need help, the first office I tell them to come to, get you know, old Senator Tim is, they'll straighten it up. And he does every time. Thank you, Senator. We're honored to have you here today.
Thank you, Kevin, very much. Thank you. Uh, to Senior Chief Dan Yaccarino, Dan, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, seeing the Senior Chief, along with all our veterans today, have protected us with their service and honored us today with their presence. So to each and every veteran today, thank you. And also serving in the military and the armed forces of the United States of America, the most magnificent armed forces the world has ever seen, is a shared sacrifice. So to all our families today, of our military service women and service men, thank you. And to Ashley and April and Violet, thank you. We have witnessed you during Dan's deployments to the Middle East. And Dan is very modest, of course, and humble. Dan is a CB and he's also been attached to swift boats, protecting our capital ships in the Middle East as attached to the Fifth Fleet from terrorist attacks. I have seen the pictures of those speed boats, or swift boats as some might call them, they bristle with 50 caliber heavy machine guns, and they are there solely to protect our capital ships when they are most vulnerable coming in and out of port from terrorist attacks. So, Dan, thank you very much. Thank you. Today, on behalf of our Representative Bill Driscoll and Representative Randy Fluker Oakley, who stand with me here today on the dais, we are here to honor and remember our brave and courageous men and women who have served in our nation's armed forces, many of whom stand beside us today, our veterans. Specifically, of course, today, we remember those that have made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our freedoms and our way of life. On this Memorial Day, we gather together to reflect on the selflessness, the courage, and the commitment of those who have courageously given their lives to protect our great nation and our citizenry. Moreover, today we honor the sacrifices that our fallen heroes and heroines have made to preserve the freedoms of the many nations the world over enjoy because of the blanket of the protection of the United States military. The most magnificent armed forces the world has ever seen. Moreover, it is important to recognize the many contributions of veterans to our nation. From the Revolutionary War to the present day global war on terror that we have been engaged in since, since September 11, 2011. Our veterans have fought and died to protect us all. For that we are eternally grateful. Today, of course, we honor our fallen heroines and heroes that have made this ultimate sacrifice in defense of our great nation, our liberties, and our way of life. Demonstrating courage, fortitude, in the face of danger, our brave heroes and heroines have served with distinction and fidelity, sacrificing their lives in the service of the Marine Corps, the United States Army, the National Guard, the Air National Guard, our Coast Guard, of course, our Space Force, and the United States Navy. And again, the most magnificent armed forces that the world has ever witnessed. A force for good throughout the globe. The we have expressed this today, and I will say it again. We owe a great debt of gratitude to our veterans for their service and dedication. Many of whom stand beside us or in front of us today, we say thank you. We must continue to remember and honor the sacrifices of our fallen heroes and heroines and acknowledge the incredible contributions that they have made to our country. On this day, we remember those who have given their lives in the service of our armed forces. In short, we remember their courage and bravery. Furthermore, we are forever grateful to our fallen service members from each and every one of our great services. Just as important today, we also thank the Gold Star families, our Gold Star families, some of whom are here today, for their sacrifice and for supporting our veterans throughout their service. You know, as a kid growing up in this great town, I remember walking across the Larry O'Neill Bridge. Corporal Larry O'Neill, this bridge is on Thatcher Street right near Clapp. Corporal O'Neill was a member of the United States Army Air Corps and he perished in action in the China, Burma, and India theater in World War II fighting for our country. I also remember the Will Cloney tennis courts being dedicated at Kelly Field. Will Cloney was killed in Vietnam fighting for our country. And of course, I remember the dedication of the Corporal Paul Curran overpass. Corporal Curran was airborne in Vietnam and was the first son of Milton to be killed in Vietnam. Of course, the Curran family today flourishes here in Milton. So let us take, take a moment of silence to remember those who have served our country and given the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our nation. Thank you. It's truly an honor again to be here with you all today with our veterans to pay tribute 
to our honored fallen heroes and heroines. And I thank the Milton Police and Fire Honor Guards. I thank our scouts, of course, our Legion Post, and our wonderful band from Milton High and our board. It's an honor to be here with you all today. God bless our fallen heroes and heroines. Let us never forget them. And God bless our gold star family. Thank you. We now have a closing prayer by Reverend Kirkham Hall from St. Michael's Episcopal Church. Blessed as we are, O Holy One, in our coming together today to hold in our hearts the memory of lives given over. May this act of remembrance speak of all that is possible even if we have seen it occasionally deferred or threatened. May it challenge us to embrace our common siblinghood while there is still time. May it bring us sustenance for the work we assert towards liberty and justice for all. And may the blessing of the one who creates and liberates and sustains us be with us now and always. Amen. We will conclude with God Bless America by our marching band. Again, thank you for all being here. I know there's other places you could be today. Memorial Day is not the kickoff of summer, regardless of what the media tells you. It is a solemn day of remembrance and always will be in Milton and I am honored to be your veterans agent and to assist with this process. You have my thanks and my appreciation for all you do and this lovely band that has uh, dealt with my issues. Thank you. 